welcome everyone to this afternoon's panel on implementing cybersecurity in DoD supply chains. I'm Dr. Bill Claycomb, a principal researcher here in the CERT division of the SEI, and I'll be your moderator. We've got five excellent panelists with us today to discuss this uh, important and, and very challenging issue, and I'll, I'll introduce them shortly. Um, supply chain has really always been an important issue, uh, whether we're talking about historical examples of armies running out of supplies at exactly the wrong time, or, or store toilet paper shelves being empty during the first couple months of COVID this year. And, and not to diminish the challenges of, of toilet paper or, or hand sanitizer supply chains, but shifting the challenge to technology supply chains, that is the hardware and software components needed to assemble a working technical system, we're faced with perhaps an order of magnitude more components and, and components of significant complexity, or it may be impossible or at least infeasible to examine every chip or every line of code to make sure that it's trustworthy. For DOD, the problem is further compounded uh, by the significant risk that elements within the supply chain would intentionally introduce untrusted components, perhaps so they could then exploit those vulnerabilities against the DOD. So I hope you agree this is a challenging and very complicated problem to address. But fortunately, we have five experts with us today to share their thoughts and answer questions about implementing cybersecurity in DOD supply chains. So I'll briefly introduce the panelists. First panelist is Mr. Joe Bradley, the director of the Air Force Cyber Resiliency Office for Weapon Systems where he's responsible for changing the cyber culture and increasing the cyber resiliency posture of Air Force weapon systems. Previously, he served as the Director of Engineering at the Air Force's Nuclear Weapons Center, responsible for both the existing nuclear weapons inventory, as well as the systems in development, including the ground-based strategic deterrent and long-range standoff weapon systems. Prior to that, Mr. Bradley served as Deputy Director of International Strategy for the Air Force, as well as the Director of Engineering for what is now known as the Digital Program Executive Office. Our next panelist is Dr. Carol Woody, Principal Researcher for the CERT Division uh, at the SEI. Her research focuses on building capabilities and competencies for measuring, managing, and sustaining cybersecurity for highly complex network systems and systems of systems. She's co-authored a book called Cybersecurity Engineering, a Practical Approach for Systems and Software Assurance, published by Pearson Education as part of the SEI series in software engineering. And she led the effort to develop the CERT Cybersecurity Engineering and Software Assurance Professional Certificate. Dr. Ken Mai is our third panelist. Dr. Mai received his BS, MS, and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from Stanford University, and is currently a principal system scientist in the electrical and computer engineering, de engineering department here at CMU. His research interests are in high-performance circuit design, secure circuit design, radiation hardening by design, reconfigurable computing, and computer architecture. Our fourth panelist is Mr. Matt Bukovic, Technical Director for the Cyber Risk and Resilience Assurance Directorate here at CERT. Matt performs research on critical infrastructure protection and develops methods, tools, and techniques for evaluating capabilities and managing risk. This includes addressing the challenges of complex supply chains, he also teaches graduate level cybersecurity policy courses for the CMU Heinz College and serves as an instructor for a number of courses focused on organizational resilience and supply chain risk management for the CMU Heinz School CISO and CRO executive certificate programs. Matt has more than 20 years of managerial and technical experience in information technology, particularly information system security, process design and audit uh, in the banking and manufacturing sectors. Fifth, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Sherman, the Technical Director of Cybersecurity Foundations Directorate here at CERT. His teams focus on secure development processes from threats to testing and on the interplay between data science and cybersecurity. Mark has been with the SEI for seven years, and before that, he held various technical leadership positions in Fortune 500 companies as well as startups. Finally, I'd like to give a call out to my good friend and my manager, Dan Costa, who is helping us today behind the scenes. Thank you, Dan. So let's get started. I've asked each panelist to give a few minutes of introductory remarks. And after that, we'll take questions from you, the audience, via the chat feature of this YouTube session. So please don't hesitate to submit those questions. We'll get to as many as we can in this hour long session. Mr. Bradley is kicking things off for us. So I will hand it over to you, Joe, to get us started. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for having me today. This is uh, it's a timely topic. You know, there's an old saying that says, you know, but for the want of a nail, the wall was lost, right? 
And think of that now, not in terms of, uh, of getting horses to the front, but think of it in terms of cybersecurity. How do I make sure that my supply chain is, number one, available to me, and number two, uh, secure and resilient so that when I actually pulse that supply chain, it's there to support my needs? You look at what's happened now. My, my job, just really quickly, is, is to make sure that the weapon systems that are provided to our warfighters are resilient and secure. And more importantly, the, the supply chains associated with those weapon systems have also got to be secure so that we don't wind up introducing either defective parts or malicious logic that comes through the supply chain. Under the great power competition, we see the fusion of our military and commercial sectors. Adversaries are weaponizing commercial activities as a means of degrading the U.S. military capability. An example is Russia cornering the rare earth markets, China's practice of commercial exploitation, including pressuring companies to transfer technology to their partner companies, exploitation in networks of scientific, academic, and business contacts to steal technology, and the potential explore, uh, exploitation of the DOD commercial supply chain to introduce counterfeit parts. Why is that important to me? It's important to me because I need to make sure that as I pulse a circuit, it responds the exact same way it was, as it was designed. It's important for me to understand what my networks look like. We have a thing called the Trusted Systems Network Program Office. There, we're actually looking at components that make up our uh, our systems. So, so um, it's a it's a systemic identification and protection of components and, and understanding that what we buy, what we procure, and what comes through the front door is exactly what we expect to go out the back door to our warfighter. So that's uh, just a brief analysis of why the supply chain is very important to the uh, Air Force and why it's important to me. Thank you, Joe. Next is Carol Woody. Carol, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, my research uh, is currently focused on improving the ways that uh, uh, we engineer security into systems. Um, engineering and architecture are based on requirements. And too frequently, we are seeing these as just lists of standards, practices, compliance mandates, uh, anything you can think of. But they are uh, totally disconnected from what's actually designed and how the architecture is actually built. Um, the acquisition documents talk about uh, information assurance, software assurance, supply chain risk management, anti-tamper. Uh, each one of these is written as if they were isolated uh, and uh, have no consideration of the trade-offs that need to be made among all of these issues, as well as ensuring that the systems uh, perform effectively and reliability. The result has been a lack of engineering rigor for the cybersecurity, uh, which is needed to field systems that will continue uh, to provide critical mission capabilities, even in the midst of compromises. Addressing this uh, gap is going to require us to think differently about the problem space. The engineer needs to determine the ways in which a system might fail and factor those into how they are designing the system to accommodate those risks or figuring out how to avoid them, designing it to prevent these problems. Some of this thinking has been applied relative to safety, but what we're seeing is that safety really doesn't care that much about functionality because a non-working system is very safe. Uh, also, safety doesn't consider the level of increased vulnerabilities uh, that are available to an attacker as we move into the software-reliant and highly interconnected systems of systems worlds. Add, uh, add to this uh, third-party software and reused components, uh, and we have far too many gaps in our operational environment. What we have developed is a... Uh, methodology that we call the Security Engineering Risk Analysis, CIRA. Uh, and this is structured to guide engineers to develop and analyze what these security risks are and to factor them in as part of their uh, engineering and trade-off discussions. The approach is aimed at uh, mission criticality uh, and the potential impacts of these missions. Uh, we have piloted this in various contexts uh, and have successfully improved the security requirements for acquisitions. We've identified security risks in operational systems that were then addressed 
with expanded operational controls in advance of a system compromise. Uh, and we've improved the ability of programs to identify mission critical assets to support their implementation of strong security practices. Uh, we're working right now on assembling a library of archetypes to facilitate engineers in thinking about the ways that their system can be compromised. This is not an area that they typically are strong in. Um, CIRA is best performed by a team that integrates designers, architects with security experts, because then you have the broad understanding of how systems can fail, along with those that understand the functionality and what needs to happen. We're seeing that investing the time early in a program to apply the engineering rigor that we need for cybersecurity can successfully improve uh, the situation in operational risk. Thank you. Terrific, Carol. Yeah, very interesting stuff and, and very important uh, topics as well. Um, I'll um, then uh, move on to Ken Mai. Ken, go ahead and take it away. Right, thanks, Bill. Um, so my work is really looking at the area of untrusted fabrication for integrated circuits, right? The concern here is the integrated circuit itself nowadays has billions of devices on it, has, you know, feature sizes in the single digit nanometer regime. So verification of that is extremely difficult. And so if it being fabricated in an untrusted facility or by an untrusted, um, extremely problematic system, right, the primary issue in the industry in general is, is that the center of mass for integrated circuit fabrication has been moving overseas, has been doing that for quite some time, primarily Asia, and they're very funely the entire model for the way integrated circuits are built in industry has been changing, right? In the olden days, you had very vertically integrated companies where they went, did everything from the device design and fabrication through to the, computing, the IC design, the architecture design, and the system design all in one company. Now, we've moved really to a fabulous semiconductor model where you have companies that design integrated circuits, but they fabricate them at, with a third party, different company, again, primarily overseas. Now, the issue for um, the USG is that there are really three pathways to creating integrated circuits that we can trust and have security. So the first is essentially the most unpalatable one, which is the government bought and owned and operate a fab, right? Which from both a technical standpoint and a cost standpoint is, is quite prohibitive, right? For, for, for leading edge and all trusted, right? For example, IBM had a trusted fab program for a number of years, um, but there are a, a smaller number of US fabrication, or is my, I'm seeing in the chat that I may be losing the audio, Bill, should I turn off video? Would that help? Yeah, Ken, we're having some issues with the video. Uh, maybe try turning off the, the video and, and see if that helps clear things up. All right, I'll turn off the video and see if that's better for that. But again, the, the next option outside of USG owning and operating a fab is that we can use domestic fabrication resources, but there are very few of those, right? For US owned and operated, you're looking at Intel and Micron. Um, additionally, Global Foundries has fabs in the US. And finally, TSMC is at least committed to potentially building fabs in the US, but hasn't done that yet. Now, the, the third option is to essentially do something clever, but still fab overseas, right? And there's been a lot of work in terms of doing logic locking and split fabrication, and a number of different things um, that are possibilities for um, still creating a trusted integrated circuit, but fabbing at one of these third party fabs, primarily in Asia. Now, the downside of this is that a lot of this work has yet to be integrated with commercial design flows. And so, you know, I hate to say it, but there's, you know, a certain amount of snake oil being peddled here and that it really requires sort of a vertical integrated solution going from the architecture all the way down to the tools in order for us to have a solution that's palatable and that will generate the circuit that we need. 
So the last thing is that for USG needs, there are a number of different specialized fab requirements that often aren't pushed very hard in industry. An example of this is building rad hard circuits for aerospace and space applications, which is an enormous industry as far as the third party fab houses go. And so there's a question about how the US government can push their priorities while unfortunately now not being a large percentage of the overall integrated circuits being fabricated, which was not the case a few decades ago. But unfortunately now, US government needs aren't a large percentage of the circuits fabricated, so they don't have the leverage. Okay, I think it looks like we lost Ken. We'll hopefully be able to improve the connection quality before we get to the Q&A part of the session. But as you can see already, just in the first three panelists that have introduced themselves, we've got a wide range of expertise available to you today. So again, to the audience, please feel free to ask questions even now so we can get them queued up of these experts. So next, I'll turn it over to Matt Bukovic. Matt, it's all yours. Thanks, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. And it's good to see we're demonstrating resilience, even in our panel, given the telecoms issues we're experiencing. So, Bill, when I was thinking about this session, and I'd like to posit to the audience that there's really two attributes that I'd like to focus on in my remarks. And certainly, these have been at the center of the research we've done recently in supply chain risk management. And that is trustworthiness and prediction. So recently, my team, in conjunction with Johns Hopkins APL, produced the CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. So determining rigorous ways to measure and then drive behavior regarding the trustworthiness of DIB players. At the end of the day, we want to ensure that we're trusting only the right parties, keeping the wrong parties out, and understanding our dependencies. So I think that from my vantage point and from my research prerogative, I'm most interested in measurement. I'm most interested in this concept of trust and resilience based on trust. So trusting the right things, understanding your risk. I would also add that an underexplored facet of supply chain risk management, from my perspective, are services. And what I mean by that is not just wafers or software, but rather the storage and compute services that we're purchasing, right? So I think that one of the things we, and I think it was so succinctly put by Joe, which is we see this convergence of DOD and commercial enterprises and capabilities. As that grows, our problems or our challenges become more comparable. And chief among those, I think, is this consumption of services in a way that allows you to find parity with your security requirements when they were wholly your own. So I would suggest that maybe a little far afield, but maybe that's the point, Bill, of this panel. When I think about supply chain risk management and the DOD, I think we have to be equipping the stakeholders with a new skill set. So certainly everything we've discussed today in research review, all of the traditional engineering applies. But I'd argue that if we're going to place an increasing reliance on third parties, that understanding third party risk management, understanding the fourth party problem, understanding the distribution of risk and dependence in elongated supply chains, the tools and education and skills for those need to be imparted to the folks managing these situations. So I'll stop there so that we can ensure we have a lively discussion. But I think, as you said, Bill, we have a number of disparate but related topics emerging here. And all of them should be front of mind for anyone interested in supply chain risk management. Terrific, Matt. Thank you. I heard a few things that hopefully will will come up again uh, during the discussion. Um, the, uh, the notion of, of the services that we consume, that is, that is uh, continuing to be a, a growing challenge as, as we tend to shift towards that model. But uh, the, the other word that I heard was prediction. And I'd really like to, uh, to explore that a little bit, little bit more. But um, hopefully uh, we'll have some questions about that. Uh, our our uh, fifth panelist is Mark Sherman. Um, so Mark, I'll go ahead and turn things over to you for your opening remarks. Thanks, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, there's an urban legend circulating around the SEI. I say that because I've never been able to track down by name who said it, but the legend is that an Air Force general came to visit once and commented, 
I used to win wars by bending metal better than anyone else. Now I'm better than the adversaries by having better software. And as a result, we tend to think of supply chain as largely hardware kind of issue, pieces, components, boxes, but software is becoming really the guts and the intelligence of these systems. And if you heard the panel yesterday with Dr. Cummings, she said, made a remark that I had never heard before, I found quite interesting. She commented that when planes launch off of aircraft carriers now, the pilots have to hold their hands up to verify that it's the computer that's taking off from the, from the aircraft carrier, not the pilot, because it's so much better at doing it than the human in, in today's systems. And so it's very important that we understand of the supply chain around software. Uh, at best today, it's a part number in a larger set of components. So we have power supplies and cases and whatever, and one number that says software, or even worse, it's embedded in a piece of a box or something else, and you don't even see it, and just the box number that has it. Because software is so malleable, because it is so vulnerable in general, we really need to be able to track the various pieces of software that are in a system at a granular enough level that when something goes wrong, we can understand what that piece was that went wrong. And as importantly, because software is vastly reused, uh, to understand where else that problem may arise in other systems that we have that are built out of common components. Historically, the DOD has focused on just immediate suppliers, not the entire supply chain. And to understand really what's going on, you have to understand all the components down. It's not simply that defense contractor provided you this particular piece of software, but inside of it has other pieces of software all the way down. So you have a uh, quite a long uh, potential uh, both fan out in depth of what the software chain looks like. This is a, as a rough feeling for those who haven't actually looked at the numbers. Uh, a typical fan out that is how many different kinds of things of peak components you might have can be in the hundreds, the depth can go into the tens. You have thousands and thousands of software components potentially in one of these kinds of systems. Something that also the uh, software supply folks as they're looking to uh, provide this kind of capability within the software supply chain for the Department of Defense is to take a little bit of um, sort of history that came out of other supply chains. And I will tend to look at, for example, the food industry as, as a good example of it. Um, first, we use the word supply chain, you know, many of the times that's a shorthand for supplier and not really a chain. But in practice, it's not even a technically a pure supply chain, it's what's more commonly called a value chain. That's because as the component moves from place to place to place, whoever's touching it adds some value along the way. So in think, think, think in terms of, again, the food industry, um, your bag salad, it started with lettuce, it goes to some distribution center, it eventually gets taken apart, it gets washed, it gets rebagged, it gets repalleted, it gets taken apart, and when it hits the distribution center and the grocery store, each of those processing stages, not only, uh, each of those processing stages offers an opportunity, frankly, for something to go wrong. So it's not so much to know, although you do need to know that lettuce came from that particular farm and they had some particular outbreak, but it could be that something happened along the way in the processing of that lettuce. So same thing in software, it may be that when it came off the developer's original desk, it was pristine, but by the time it came to you, the processing that happened along the way introduced errors and therefore it's or vulnerabilities. So you need to understand the entire value chain, not simply the supply chain of how a component went from piece to piece. A second lesson that we can take from the food industry is what I would call the invariant. Um, and the best examples of this, for example, are called the cold chain in food and pharmacy, or if you're more familiar with law enforcement, the custody chain. But the idea is there's something that you can say about the component that doesn't change as it moves from place to place to place. So if it has some sort of security validation associated with it, that security invariant has to be maintained as it gets added or subtracted to other uh, larger components that eventually gets into the plane or, or ship or whatever it is that you're building. Uh, the last one is what I call the tool issue. And again, looking at the food industry as an example, you see these warnings on your candy bar saying, uh, this was processed on a machine that also processes nuts. That's a way of saying that even though the chocolate may not hurt you, the fact that it was produced on a machine may still have implications to you. As it turns out, tools, the tool chain that's used to build software is an increasingly uh, vulnerable and exploited method for, um, for attacking mm -hmm. software. There are various examples in where tools that are used to compile it or otherwise process it 
have introduced the errors, even though what the programmer wrote was fine, the compiler was fine, but the other kinds of tools that touched it along the way added vulnerabilities. And so all of these things require us to be able to track and understand what components we have at a granular enough level to, um, to uh, fix things whenever we learn them, either because they're errors or vulnerabilities, as well as the tools used to build them, because that may be the uh, source of any vulnerability that was introduced. So we've got, uh, you know, with the shift of the world mindset to having software basically replacing hardware, uh, we need to start thinking the software at the same kind of granularly replaceable level that we think in terms of the hardware components and the chips. Terrific, Mark. Thanks. I, I wanted to go ahead and just come right back to you uh, with a question uh, uh, along the lines of the supply chain, uh, or so, I'm sorry, the uh, the cust chain of custody um, an, an analogy that you made. Uh, a term that that I've heard recently is the uh, software bill of materials, the S bomb. Is that uh, what? What can you explain that a little bit more? And is is that essentially what you're describing? Is this chain of custody, or is is that something different? So the supply, uh, so the software bill of materials, or S bomb, as the people working on the standard uh, tend to abbreviate it, is a way that you can start to categorize the pieces that are in your software package, so that you can start asking those same kind of questions that we asked. You know, if I do, I have a component that's been um, um, uh, attacked or made vulnerable in some way, or have we found a problem with this particular component? So attaching a software bill of materials to the final thing that you get is certainly a start. Uh, how you implement that in the entire chain becomes problematic. Um, for example, you may have vendors who feel that they have competitive distinctions. They don't want to tell you what's in those pieces because they think that's their magic sauce. And by revealing that, uh, they'll be competitive, they'll have a competitive disadvantage. And frankly, I've actually experienced this in my own life. One of the startups I was with built OEM software that went into other packages. And frankly, half of our customers wanted to tout that we were contained in them because they thought that was a way to show they were new and different and improved. And the other half didn't want it there because they thought it would take away their brand value, the thing that it was contained in, and they wanted to say that they were the brand value, not the stuff that they licensed from us to put in. So that's a recurring commercial tension that um, doesn't have a very easy answer. Um, there's also adversarial disclosure. It turns out that much of software that's composed and distributed, frankly, is out of date and has known vulnerabilities in it. Um, the CVE is filled with information about vulnerabilities of existing packages. And if you uh, reveal in detail what's inside your package, an adversary can basically look at that same bill of materials and say, I know exactly how to attack that. And in fact, uh, we discovered that at one of the uh, energy labs where they, built, they bought some commercial software. Uh, when they looked inside, they found it had a variety of things that if the people knew what was in that commercial software, they would also know immediately how to attack it. Uh, sometimes they don't even know what the composition is. If you have someone who wants to do this, uh, you can um, not always rely on it. Again, I worked for another company and where they wanted to be very meticulous about understanding what pieces were in there. Frankly, they were worried about legal liabilities more than vulnerabilities, but they wanted to make sure that they didn't, that nothing went out that they didn't know about. And so, in fact, they made all the developers sign affidavits before a software product went out saying, I promise that I did this, this, and this, and I didn't go out on the net and grab things or what have you. Um, I was amused to learn later that I talked with one of these companies that does uh, uh, software composition analysis. It's a whole new uh, chain of tools that have come out. And I commented, I worked for this company, and I, in fact, I was a product manager for one of these products. And I said, I hate when there was part of a discussion of, is this software clean or not? That is, uh, this is what we know is free of vulnerabilities. And I said, I, at this company, we never put in stuff that wasn't checked. And he said, let me tell you a secret. We've run our tools on that piece of software, and that's not true. That's not actually what actually gets put out in the market. Um, it also can hinder some flexibility. And this is somewhat connected with the granularity issue. Let's say, for simple simplicity, you're talking about you include a Linux distribution in your software package. Linux is in almost all of your IoT devices that you look at but it's not the entire Linux distribution. That Linux distribution has thousands of components. When you take out all of those components, what goes in the bill of materials? Is it just the things that you left in? What happens if you wanna put one of them back in later? Um, and finally, you're worried about legal protection. Again, in the case of that one company I was referring to, if it became disclosed that they actually included something that violated a patent of another company, something they tried to avoid, but again, if you don't really know what's in there, then it opens up for legal liability it's frankly, obscurity is security for them in that respect. If you don't know what's in there, you can't be sued for having it in it. So there's a lot of issues involved to make this a practical, um, a 
process. Uh, standards are starting in where they're going to layer the kinds of details that provided in the Bill of Materials, uh, but we'll have to see how it rolls out in practice. Terrific, Mark. Thanks. That was a, a really uh, detailed answer. I, I appreciate it. Um, I want to shift over to uh, to Mr. Bradley for a minute and sort of uh, present a m more open-ended question. Um, so, so Joe, if if you were king for a day, say, uh, what would you do to enhance the cybersecurity uh, of of DoD supply chain? Thank you. Great question. Um, and I worry about that a lot. I wonder sometimes, you know, if, if I could make the rules, what what would I do? I would tell you that I would get away from commercial off-the-shelf technologies. We've, uh, we fell in love with that because it was a great cost savings and it supposedly uh, increased the speed at which we could field systems. Uh, we're averaging about seven years to get a system from uh, concept to field and that's just way too long. Uh, I, I would go more towards, uh, you know, back when I was going to school, you had a TTL, TTL logic design book, right? And you could build any chip you wanted as long as it was in that TTL logic book. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to pre-screen the parts and the software, you know, white listing of code, and, and just say to folks, hey, you know, you need to build this single board computer or this unique device using these pre-approved parts. Okay, so if I go to the store and I buy a box of Legos, I don't see any uh, Tinker Toys in them. I see Legos. They, if they fit together, they work together. I'd like to do that, and I'd like to see that in the Air Force acquisition process where we use, we use the Trusted Systems Network Lab down in San Antonio. We'll use it after the fact. After we've spent a year or so into the design phase, then we say, hey, let's make sure these, these components are what we expect. How do I bring that further to the left so that we can do that? If our king for the day, I'd mean that that would be it, and we'd only build from the components and parts that were through that lab and approved. Okay, uh, so I guess I'd like to to think about for a minute the uh, something you said right at the beginning of your comments about shifting away from uh, from caught software and and shift um, sort of back to to Matt's opening statement about the uh, the increased reliance on on services you know that, that were. Um, relying more on the hardware and software that's that's provided by third parties. Um, so Matt, I mean, do you do you think that um, that shifting away from sort of reliance on COTS is uh, congruent with uh, an increased reliability on a more service-based approach? Well, I think the answer might be that we should be asking more of those that produce those COTS products, right? So mm -hmm. I, with, with, with Joe's observations regarding understanding what's in the box, right? So um, I think Mark did a, a great job of explaining some of the, the, the traceability problems that we have, the need for a software bill of materials is one. Um, and if you expand that, that concept broadly, we need to have a traceability element to all of this, be it a component of course, or software increasingly services. How do you know the right activities uh, were conducted uh, related to the service you've purchased, right? Uh, so, Bill, do I think the world's going to go back to buying bespoke hardware and software? I, I don't. I, I think that's that's a hard sell. Are there specific strategic and uh, sensitive areas where that makes a lot of sense? I, I, I believe so, and I, I'd love to hear more from, from, from Joe and others about that. But um, I, I think that um, being in this converged world of, of IT software, or sorry, of IT services, software, and hardware is probably here to stay. In fact, if you look at things like the rise of a network function virtualization, where very elaborate uh, and dedicated uh, engineering is required to, to allow for network connectivity being replaced by scads of, of consumer grade Linux boxes pretending to be routers, um, I think we're actually headed in that direction. And I think that um, we sort of can't fight the future, but we can ask more of those that are shaping the future. So I think that it's really us being smart consumers while recognizing that uh, we're probably not going to have the same direct degree of control in the software, hardware, and services uh, that we have, that we're purchasing and requiring now than we did in the past. It, it just, the, the world is increasingly requiring us to put faith and, uh, and ultimately hand the reins to a third party. Carol, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I'd like to add a little bit to that. Uh, we tend to stovepipe the way we think about a system, what we decide we want to have, and then go off and assemble all of these parts, put them together, and then we're surprised. We don't get what we thought we wanted in the first place. Uh, and I see that as a huge disconnect because you've got decisions being made at different points in time that are not integrated together. 
Uh, if you're engineering in um, cybersecurity, then you need to be looking at it from the perspective of what code am I getting? Where is it coming from? Third parties. Does that meet what I need to have? Uh, part of that should be part of your selection criteria. Uh, not just, oh, I'm going to use all of these pieces because I happen to already have them around, even though they don't quite do what I want to do and I have to Rube Goldberg jury rig them together and God knows what else I've put in between. Um, and I think this holistic approach, Matt, just continuing on what you're saying, but adding more to the group in terms of tying it back to what you said you needed, what the stakeholders think they want, and putting rigor into all of those pieces pieces uh, with solid trade-off choices because you can't have everything. You know you're going to have limitations. And by the way, you've got a cost and schedule you have to live within. Um, so all of those pieces need to tie together. Uh, but I think we need more of the right minds into the problem set uh, at each point in time. We don't need somebody in acquisition going off and making some choices that are separate from what we know we can do and how the pieces need to work together operationally. My two cents. No, that's terrific. Um, and I guess, um, you know, we've been talking a little bit about software uh, from from software perspective. Uh, maybe we can uh, shift over to more of the hardware and, and circuit uh, design uh, and get Ken's thoughts on the on the issue of COTS versus sort of bespoke products. I'm sure. Hopefully my audio and video hold up. Oh, maybe not. Um, so I'm getting the notification that I have unstable internet. So I'm going to clip off my video, unfortunately. Um, all right, so I think there, there's an interesting question here about COTS versus uh, bespoke parts. I mean, this came up a number of years ago when there was a push in DoD circles to move towards FPGAs and programmable solutions versus ASICs, right? Um, and I think, and so you know, we hear a lot of people talk about, for example, in the F-35, the enormous number of FPGAs in, in those systems. Um, now, the challenge is that I think there was a notice that, well, if you go to FPGAs, you're losing order of magnitude or more in performance, energy efficiency, um, even though the overall cost is lower and the time to feel that the, the system. But so this is really looking at tools and generators. So we're not looking at handcrafting every piece anymore. And also to, um, I think, believe the first point, um, third party IP blocks and how we accrete those together. Now there's one interesting piece of technology that's recently come. That's this oh, smaller integrated circuits on essentially a carrier or interposer so they look like they're on one chip. For those of you that have been around for a while, this is similar to the old style of multi-chip modules and MCMs. Um, so there's been some government investment in, for example, an interposer fab in Florida called Bridge. And, and so I think that's a technology where, as Joe pointed out, you could bring together a number of pre-verified parts onto a bespoke design and get a little bit of the best of both worlds, right? You're not costing quite as much as a pure large custom ASIC. You've pre-verified the, the components, but you can still uh, feel the part relatively quickly and get good performance, good energy efficiency. Thanks, Ken. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, I think we, we made it through with, with uh, you know just some minor issues on the audio, so uh, good deal, thank you. Um, I want to sort of shift to uh, questions about prioritizing um, needs for DOD. You know, what uh, if we think about what are the, the most pressing issues, what is the most uh, critical vulnerabilities or the biggest risk to DOD supply chain today? Uh, what, what, what would those be? What does DOD need to be doing today to address um, cybersecurity uh, in, the, in the supply chain? And I guess, Matt, I'll go ahead and, and see, uh, ask you to kick off the the response to that question. Sure, Bill, maybe I'll, I'll, I think I might start my answer in a place different than my colleagues in the panel. And I'm not going to give you a technology or a threat actor as an answer. I'm going to say the, the number one threat, to the duty supply chain or cyber supply chain is complexity, right? Which is understanding the universe, the, the broader expanse of things we need to know 
to effectively make risk decisions in the supply chain. So I, I think if, if the supply chain um, is deeper and it's, it's more elongated and it's more opaque in ways uh, than it ever has been. So uh, I would argue that, that, that those, those facets of the challenge are the most enduring. The technology stack is going to change over time, right? If we were doing this panel 10 years from now, who knows the specific town up technology we might be discussing. But I believe these, these questions and challenges of complexity and visibility will be with us for a very long time. And I would then posit that we should concentrate at least some effort on addressing those challenges in addition to the technical challenges. Terrific. Um, does, it, does anybody else want to jump in on that one? Mark? Well, Joe, if you want to, I'm happy to let you go next. Yeah, thanks. Just real quick, I, I'd like to add on that. You know, the other challenge we're going to have is, is provenance, right? Where do things come from? Where were they built? Where are they used on? What are the other systems? And, and then if I know what, what the systems that I have and how they function, and I know that somebody else has them, can I then exploit that, you know, in the supply chain? Can I then have a, a look, feel, similar software, similar um, similar hardware into the supply chain? So it's just understanding where, what's the pedigree look like of this, of the components? Or... Okay, uh, Mark. Sure. So I, um, although I'll remain technical, despite what Matt was suggesting, but I also take a different viewpoint here. Uh, I think the the biggest issue that we've tried to address when working with our DOD customers is not spending a lot more effort on hardening the supply chain per se, much as we would like to. We've all gone through the various challenges in trying to do that. Um, but starting with the belief, maybe I'm in the minority here, that both COTS and open source are going to be more important and increasingly uh, installed into uh, DOD systems. It's managing the results of having a bad component in your system. How, what, how do you build these things so they are resilient and they can recover and they can even uh, you know, monitor what's going on? So when we talk about designs of the next generation of systems with, with our customers, uh, we're talking about how they introduce diversity, heterogeneity, redundancy, and uh, monitoring as a way to keep track of what's going on. And when something goes wrong and you know, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to uh, think of some autonomous system or some system that's not uh, readily accessible, that it has to self-detect it, has to be able to somehow uh, partition off the bad piece, ideally maybe even uh, somehow repair or at least uh, mitigate whatever the problem was to get back to the functionality. Understanding that you're not going to be able to manage the risk, you're not going to have full provenance and pedigree of what you've got. So instead, how do you manage um, these untrustworthy components in, in order to build a system. Hey, Carol, uh, do you want to do you want to add something? Um, I'd like to add another consideration here, and that is the uh, the push from the program offices we've seen uh, because they are financially constrained is always to the cheapest solution, uh, and we are we are seeing continually the lack of consideration of uh, how. The security of those pieces and how the uh, functionality is managed and maintained uh, is uh, not part of that uh, choice. And so broadening the aperture in terms of the considerations around the selections in the supply chain, I think is going to be critical uh, in terms of moving forward. Uh, we're also seeing a, uh, a focus on shared resources that uh, will be used broadly across multiple programs, uh, but we're not seeing consideration of the differences in the risk positions of the multiple programs that are using them and effectively figuring out the inherited risks so that you're addressing the right security concerns within a program itself uh, is going to become an increasing challenge. Um, so supply chain offers a lot of opportunities, but we're not, I think, effectively considering the risks that are coming along with it in terms of systems design. Yeah, I think you're right there, Carol. Um, I agree. Uh, we have a question from uh, the audience, from Tom, who asks, uh, can the panel address how the rise of a hardware and software co-evolution complicates these issues, especially where vulnerabilities and risks arise as the emergent behavior of these complex systems? Um, so Matt, do you, wanna, do you wanna take a stab at that? Yeah, I think you're on mute. My apologies, Bill, I was on mute. 
Um, so, so great question. Uh, I, I think to kind of when I'm framing this uh, for myself, I'm thinking you have this this population of, of vulnerabilities and complexities related to hardware and software, right? And, and those are challenging enough on their own. And then as, as you watch this this interplay between the two, you're left with a with a host of, of new considerations, right? So I think that um, maybe at the heart of that question is an understanding uh, that we should all have that the the, the hardware and software technologies will uh, grow by fits and starts. They will be in different stages of evolution at any point in that continuum. And that may produce uh, results that are very difficult to manage. I think Mark was spot on when he said that the, the, the goal needs to be ensuring that we can return from uh, some disrupted or degraded state uh, in, in our, our software and hardware systems and supply chain. So. Um, yeah, I, I guess as, as sort of an answer overall, um, I, I think this is an area where convergence, with my, in my opinion, I'm going to nominate for maybe theme of the panel. Um, if, if we're looking at these as different engineering disciplines, this is certainly the spot on the Venn diagram where we have to cross, right? The hardware engineers and the software engineers. Uh, also, we know that those lines are blurring, right? That uh, devices now can be kind of both at the same time or neither, right? Depending on, on mode and, and use. So. Um, I, I think that um, this the, the the question identifies a an emerging, in my opinion, potential blind spot, uh, and we need to ensure that collectively we understand um, how the interplay between these things is, is is reshaping our understanding of it. Terrific. Um, anyone else want to want to add anything on that? So again, I'll offer a slightly different spin. I. As you might have guessed from my previous comments, we'd argue there's really very little, if any, distinction between hardware and software. They're just particular ways that these that the rules and algorithms get packaged up and delivered, uh, saying that somehow FPGAs or uh, a grade of manufacturing or, or just uh, you know raw C code are somehow inherently different. I think um, this is the point. I think they're actually quite the sim quite the same. And you know we don't even think twice now about the fact that we're programming our printers to print things as opposed to in the past where we just had you know, images that got copied automatically. And so I don't think so much the hardware software interaction, you could ask that same question about any number of components that have to be co-developed. I don't, the fact that one's in silicon or not, I think is, um, you know, uh, an artifact, not necessarily the core issue. Uh, what I think a, a more challenging issue is what I'd call the change in operational environment. When we build these systems, we usually make assumptions about how they're going to be operated. Uh, a very crude example is I don't have to worry about securing this, this particular system because I've got fences and guards um, sitting around it, and therefore that's enough. Uh, all of a sudden, when you're in a situation that's not true, then that has a problem. It's a couple of examples that people are familiar with, uh, the furnaces in, in, in Germany that got destroyed because the SCADA system got co compromised. Now, I'm sure the person who built the SCADA system never had any thought that somehow someone was going to get into their SCADA system and they had to protect against sending bad commands out to the furnaces. But you can see the history. They did the SCADA system and marketing said, well, let's connect this up to the ERP system so we have a view of what's going on. And then the salesman said, let's connect it to the CRM system so that I can figure out what I can sell or not, what's being produced or not. And then someone said, oh, let's make customers see what the status of their order is. They put a web interface on it. Now all of a sudden the attacker could get through the CRM system to the ERP system to the SCADA system and destroy the furnace. Same kind of thing with the brakes on, on the Jeep. I'm sure the guy who programmed the brake, the, sorry, the brake software had no concept that someone was going to come through the entertainment system and uh, be able to control the brakes remotely. So he had a, a, a zone of trust and that got violated. And as we build different components that are fitting together, we make assumptions about how those components will interact. And when they get put in a different operational environment, those assumptions get violated and that introduces problems. So, Mark, I'd like to sort of pivot on that idea that, that sometimes it's the components that we don't expect um, that, that introduce the vulnerabilities. And so when we think about supply chain security and introducing uh, more security into the supply chain, um, you know, is there, can we say that, that some systems maybe are more important to consider in terms of supply chain than other uh, systems? And so as sort of an extreme, just to illustrate the question, um, you know, we, we have IoT devices on one end, um, the smart devices and things that sort of have one little function uh, versus maybe the back end servers. And so, you know, could we, should we say that, uh, you know, if we want to focus our, our supply chain security efforts, that it would be more important to focus them on the, the big 
heavy duty backing stuff or the little ones because there's a whole lot more of them. So uh, I, I was gonna uh, get Carol's thoughts on that. Carol? One of the areas we're seeing that's becoming uh, critical is not so much to focus on specific pieces of hardware or software, but to really understand what your missions are dependent on. Uh, your mission threads, the scenarios of what it's going to take to get your operations done. Uh, because if uh, some small hardware piece that's not critical to your mission gets compromised and there's not a direct connection that's going to uh, be a worry for you in terms of completing the mission, uh, then that's probably of less concern. But what we're seeing is that very few of the uh, programs are actually really thinking through all these parts and pieces I'm assembling. What is it I'm really depending on to have my mission complete? And which ones of these odd pieces that I'm concerned about can become uh, attack vectors? Uh, so if we just focus on critical assets in the middle uh, and uh, put uh, extra protections around those, if we haven't also thought about how we've left open potential vectors to come in and attack, which could be from IoT devices, they could be from uh, uh, servers that you're connected to that maybe you don't even control, or uh, other pieces that you haven't really looked at because you haven't really articulated what your mission uh, is dependent on. And it may be other related systems that some other program controls. Uh, it's all of these integrations that are adding to the complexity uh, that are actually making it more difficult for us to determine where we do need to focus. Because in reality, you can't fix everything. And I think uh, um, we've already mentioned that you have to recognize, resist, and recover. But you have to plan that into how you're designing your systems as well. And which pieces do you recover? And what do you keep as the most important to up and running? Uh, it's probably the pieces that uh, you haven't really thought about that are going to be the real challenge to you. And that's why we're talking about engineering rigor fitting into this. Really, not just designing all of these pieces with all of this possible functionality that you might be able to do, but what are you really relying on and making sure that that's really hardened to the extent that uh, uh, you can in terms of uh, monitoring and managing the pieces and parts. And some of those might be these little IoT devices because they're your key communication mechanisms from uh, the employee that's now working at home uh, to the, the main system that uh, you're trying to run uh, in the offices and keep uh, your, your everyday operations up and running. Um, so we have to think in terms of what is it we're really relying on and how do we really harden those to the greatest extent possible. Mark, did you have some comments on that? Sure, I'd like to uh, uh, follow on a key comment that Carol just made. Um, it's the importance of the system, not the technology. It's not so much IoT versus rather servers. It's my pacemaker versus my Space Invaders game. I really care about my pacemaker not being attacked. I'm less worried about my Space Invader game being attacked. And that's really where I have my focus. Uh, someone named Sandy Clark did an analysis of where do uh, bad guys go after? And if you might, as you might imagine, the um, results are not surprising. They follow the money. And so uh, things that are of high value that they can extract value from, that's where they want to go and that's where you put your, put your efforts. Um, there was a recent interview uh, of a Russian uh, syndicate uh, that was published. I don't know why they would give such an interview, but they did. And, they, and the, the person there stated, you know, we go after things like hospitals and banks because they have the money to give us. Sure, I can hack an Android phone, but what do I get for all of that effort? It's a lot of effort, no return on investment. I'm going to go where the money is. And so, so too, that's where I would spend, you know, efforts uh, in order to secure things, whether it's supply chain or otherwise. That makes a lot of sense, Mark. Um, and I'd like to, I'd like to keep going on that because it's a really interesting issue. But unfortunately, um, our hour is almost up and I, I didn't want to um, go ahead and give each panelist uh, a minute to, to sort of pr present any final thoughts uh, before we before we end the session. So, uh, Mark, since since you went last during the opening remarks, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, go first here for the, the closing? 
Sure. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, everybody. I think it's been an interesting um, hour or so. Uh, the, my closing comment would be that the topics that we've been talking about here, um, I've had the experience of introducing to various DOD programs, and in my experience, I see light bulbs going off. The recognition of what these issues are is now being taken to heart, and it's now a matter of trying to uh, implement those in appropriate policy, language, and processes that they have to work through. But at least the need is now more clearly understood. Terrific. Thanks, Mark. Matt, over to you. Yeah, Bill, thanks. I'd like to first thank my, my fellow panelists. It's a really great discussion. We could probably have another three hours of it if the schedule permitted. So um, focus on the critical few, right? That's, that's the main takeaway that I would offer, which is we know the supply chain is vast, uh, it's even malleable in meaning, as Mark pointed out, value chain, supply chain. Um, what should you focus on? Well, things that are life critical, safety critical, of course, but beyond that, what does the list look like? So I would say, uh, kind of in closing, if we apply the things we know work in risk management in other domains and disciplines to these challenges, uh, it will show the way for us. Terrific. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Ken. Um, over to you for a closing sure, I'm, I'm not going to risk my, my video this time. Um, so I just wanted to, to make a point about sort of where the discussion's been going and this focus on, well, you know, which systems do we do we focus on? I think one of the things to be concerned about, you know, from my perspective, is if I think about the circuit board itself, while, yes, there are, you know, 10, 100, you know, multi-thousand dollar parts on there, there are also typically thousands of one cent resistors and capacitors and so on. And those are vectors for attack in you know, counterfeiting and robustness problems just as easily as the $1,000 FPGA is. And so I think there, you know, sometimes there's a focus on the expensive parts, whereas the overall system is built up of, you know, a few expensive parts and thousands of really cheap parts. And the problem is that those one cent resistors suddenly become, you know, $50 resistors if you apply supply chain tracking and everything else to them. And that's just something from an economic standpoint we need to be concerned about. Yeah, I, I think, um, th again, there's a whole huge uh, discussion that we could have had uh, around the economics involved with, uh, with all this. Uh, and so you, you bring up some very interesting points that I wish we could, <laughs> I wish we could dive in. I wish we had another hour. Um, but uh, but uh, thank you for, for your comments. Um, Carol, we'll turn it over to you. Um, I would um, summarize by saying don't be daunted by the complexity. Uh, there is a vast number of, of ways and things that can happen. But if you start with your operational side of how do you want the pieces to actually work together and what's your most critical and work back from there, uh, you can create uh, a very good picture of where you need to place your priorities and the ways in which you need to think about uh, the pieces to ensure that the operational environment you want keeps running the way you need to have it run. Uh, and you also need to design in ways to keep it resilient. Uh, we see that as a, a, a an area that is not as strongly emphasized in terms of uh, the, the system's design. There's a push for functionality and less of consideration of mission resilience. Uh, and if you focus on those two areas, I think you can make the good dent critical areas with supply chain as well as just overall cybersecurity. Yeah, I think designed in security is a, probably a common theme throughout um, several of the sessions uh, during the research review here. It's a really important topic to consider and, and something that people need to be um, focusing on more. Uh, Joe, you are um, you're, you're the, the last one. Go ahead and bring us home. Oh, thanks. I'm probably all that's standing between the audience and a break right now. But thank you very much for having me. This panel has been fantastic. Some amazing minds, amazing thoughts. And I just feel uh, honored to be among the people here. Uh, I kind of want to leverage a little bit of what Ken said. Uh, you know, the, the, the item that we talk about a lot is your biggest risk to the items beneath contempt. Those one cent resistors, those things that you just say, oh, don't worry about it. They're never going to, they're not going to cause me a, uh, a cyber issue. Those are the ones that are going to bite you at the end. Uh, and and kind of, you know, everybody's talked a lot about supply chain security and, and it does start with component design. You know, you, you have got to start your initial system design thinking about how am I going to keep this secure in the supply chain? I'm, I'm actually dealing with an issue right now where uh, they didn't establish a supply chain, but they fielded a system. And, and I'm struggling with that. Uh, 
the thing we've got to realize is we're never going to eliminate risk. We really have to prioritize those essential functions, and we have to understand, well, what can we do and what can we live with and how can we live with them in a contested and degraded environment and utilize all the tactics, techniques, and procedures available to us to get through. So thanks for having us. This has been great. Terrific. Thanks, Joe. Uh, and thanks to each of our panelists for sharing your time and your expertise expertise <laughs> with us today. Um, thanks to Dan Costa also for helping out behind the scenes. And of course, uh, thank you to you, our audience, for joining us today. So um, have a good afternoon, everybody. Take care. Thank you.